So the Itobi i3 is almost done. And what typically takes the longest is wiring everything up properly. Now, I know that part is not fun, it's not rewarding, at least not for me. And it's like this huge threshold between having a machine that looks finished, you know, with all the parts mounted and ready to go, and a machine that actually works. But at the wiring stage, you are actually setting the foundation for a machine that works reliably and is open for future modifications without it ending up as a total hack job. So today I want to give you a rundown of what wiring to use, how to manage it properly and how to connect everything up. And I need to start out with a disclaimer. Basically, as always, use some common sense. I can give you the basics of good practices, but ultimately you'll be responsible for how you set everything up. Cables can overheat and potentially catch fire if they are sized improperly or wear out due to improper strain relief. This guide can help you avoid the most common mistakes, but please don't sue me if you make one that it didn't cover. All right, let's go. Let's start out with what cables to use. First off, what wire gauge to use for the various functions in your 3D printer. So there's basically three tiers of components you'll see. There are sensors, fans, and motors, which use practically no current. Then hotend heaters with a 12 volt heater drawing close to four amps and a heated bed, typically around 12 amps. So what I like to use for, let's call it tier one, is Ethernet cable for a few reasons. First off, it's cheap. Unshielded CAD5 cable is all you typically need and it's like 20 cents per meter. And that gives you eight wires twisted in pairs, which is great for what we are doing because not only are they nicely bundled up, having them twisted also keeps any electromagnetic interference in check. The one thing you should keep in mind though is that you want to get the flexible version and not the one with solid wires. More on that in a second. Even the cheaper 26 gauge wires or 0.13 millimeters squared are rated for around 2 amps, which is plenty for a fan or sensor and still just barely enough for a stepper motor. The way you should use twisted pairs is to have one wire carrying the current to the component and the other taking it back. So in case of a fan, that's positive and negative. For a motor, there will be the two connections from each coil, which are the black and green, as well as the red and blue wires. For an end stop, signal and ground, and for a thermistor, obviously the leads of that. What's also nice about Ethernet cable is that because it has these two layers of insulation, it tends to keep the wires in a larger radius compared to individual wires, which is good for keeping them from wearing out due to the repetitive bending motion you'll see when printing. There are two factors that decide how well a cable is suited for being repetitively bent. One is the insulation, in this case plain PVC, not ideal, but usually good enough. Silicone would be better, but is much more expensive. And the other factor is the makeup of the copper conductor. You can obviously get solid core and stranded wire, and when you bend them both in the same radius, the surface of the solid wire is going to stretch and compress much more than each individual surface of each strand. Solid wire is perfect for bending it into shape and then leaving it, but stretching and compressing copper too many times will break it. So the finer the strands, the more suitable a wire is for being moved around. Now again, the Ethernet cable I'm using is reasonably fine stranded, but an even better choice would be specifically made cables that have extra fine strands, especially when you need them to repeatedly bend around tight radii, which I'll show you later how to avoid. Okay, so second tier components, heaters. Now, I also use Ethernet cable here, but a single conductor is not enough for a 12 volt 40 watt heater. So I usually use two wires and a total of two pairs here. Now, you don't just want to use one pair for positive and the other for negative. You actually want the plain wires together for one phase and the strip ones for the other. That way you have the forward current twisted to the return current. If you want to use a single wire instead, you'll need something around a 22 gauge or 0.75 millimeter squared wire. Since the heater typically isn't on for extended periods at a time, but instead pulsed, you do have some leeway there. Now for tier three, the heated bed, you'll need something a bit more massive than that. And for a typical PCB heater, I'd actually recommend using a thicker wire than needed to minimize losses in the wire itself as that will take away much more of the available heating power from the bed than you'd expect. As such, at least something around 12 gauge or 
2.5 to 4 millimeters squared is what I'd recommend using. What usually fits that bill is speaker wire because wannabe audio files will completely oversize their wiring several orders of magnitude to get that last bit of crispiness out of their speakers. But just make sure the wire is, again, fine enough and actually copper, as the cheaper copper clad aluminum speaker wires will break much more easily under stress and fail over time in most connectors. Another good alternative is silicone wire, as used in electric RC cars. It's a good bit more expensive, but is actually a perfect match for the job. Now next up, how do you route those cables to your components? What I actually see people doing is checking at which spot the cable needs to be the longest and then just cutting them to length, which isn't really ideal. What you'll get is this caterpillar effect and the cable might end up going anywhere, you know, sideways, down, wherever. A better way to handle it would be to create an anchor point somewhere in the middle of the axis and routing the cables there in a half loop so that you'll never get the cables completely stretched straight at any point. Of course, how you can route them is going to depend on your exact printer, but in any case, having them in sort of a, a loop or a half loop is always going to be easier on the wires and easier to manage. Now, you still want to make sure the wires don't end up kinking or flexing in the same spot over and over again, so you still need to take care that the point where the cable is fixed to the moving and standing parts has some sort of support. This can simply be a bit of filament or simply the wire's insulation itself if it is stiff enough. You just want to keep it supported at the most critical spots. Now to really get it not only looking a bit more nicely but also out of the way and bundled together more tightly, there are two more options. Nylon mesh and drag chains. Drag chains are great but they can be tricky to use right, so let's start out with the nylon sleeving. You can get it in all sorts of sizes and it keeps your wires out of sight bundled together and somewhat supports them at the same time. By the way, it's the same stuff as used by computer enthusiasts and power supply manufacturers. Your other option are drag chains and on the Itopi we actually used both. We used nylon sleeving here and a drag chain for the bed. So a drag chain is made to be used like this and not like this. Its job is basically to keep the wire in a precisely defined bending radius constantly. Though the problem is, if you want to use a drag chain, you have to plan for it because typically you aren't going to have any surfaces to mount it to to get that, that rolling motion. They come in two versions. The first one opens up to just let you drop in your wiring. The other stays closed and you'll need to push the wires through by hand, which might be a tight fit if you have any sort of connectors on their end. What's also important to keep in mind with them is to only use a zip tie for the wires on one end not on both, or you might end up stretching, compressing and breaking the wires as the drag chain moves. So always leave a bit of slack on one end before anchoring it down again. Now, what I like to use for keeping the wires exactly where I want them are these little stick-on anchors. Again, they're really inexpensive, links in the video description by the way, and they give you spots to zip tie any wires to without having to drill holes or zip tie around any larger components. You can also get them with a reusable twisty thing already attached, but those don't hold the wires down as tightly, which can be okay for a lot of places. Now, connectors are easy to overlook. If you've got cables that already have all the connectors on them, you're good to go. But it's not too hard to add your own either. And I'm not going to go into full detail on how to use these tools. I think there are plenty of videos on YouTube already, but I can show you what to use. I've personally settled on two types of connectors, as they are compatible to what's typically used on controller boards and easy to crimp yourself. The first type are what's called DuPont connectors. They are one tenth of an inch or 2.54 millimeter connectors and they are crimped onto the wires. They don't have any keying and that means they will pretty much universally fit on any other tenth of an inch connector, whether it's these wide types as used for computer fans or the more complex locking types as seen on some boards. Oh, and you can use male and female pins with them so you can really easily craft extensions or disconnect points. All of these use the same crimping tool to get the contacts attached to the wire and are ready for about two to three amps, which is perfect for all those tier one consumers, including motors. Now for tier two heaters, simply using two pins in a connector is a valid concept but you're not going to find any board that has that sort of a connection. 
So what I like to use for hot end and bed heaters are these larger crimp connectors. Again, they're a family of connectors that span anything from male and female blade connectors, wire ends or spade terminals for attaching to your power supply. So that's what you know, an assortment of these typically looks like. Now, both of these crimping tools are great to have and they make properly wiring a 3D printer just so much easier. And you know, you can use them for anything else as well. I paid about 20 bucks for each one of these with a big set of connectors and that was totally worth it. So one last tip I want to give, make wiring plans and label your cables. It's super easy to do, just write down which wires and which cables you're using for what functionality. And since they are color coded, you know exactly where to look. And even the simplest plans can help you out a ton should you ever want to modify anything or have to look for an issue down the road. This video is sponsored by Alev Objects Inc, a free software, libre innovation and open source hardware company headquartered in Loveland, Colorado, USA and makers of Loadspot desktop 3D printers. Watch my reviews of both Loadspot 3D printers here and check the links in the video description for more info on the machines straight from Alev Objects. So if you enjoyed this video, leave me a thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. And if you want to support the general thing I'm doing here, consider subscribing or directly throwing me a dollar or two over on Patreon. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.